In this week's video, we'll be reviewing the latest technical and fundamental data to help us answer the question, how strong is the recession and bear market case? In order to properly analyze present day data, it's extremely important that we understand and put it into some historical context. It's a daily chart of the S&P 500, 1994 on the left side of your screen, out to the stock market peak March 24th of 2000 on the right side of your screen. Our purpose here is to understand the state of mind of investors as the market is peaking in the year 2000. So what's in their rear view mirror when they look backwards from this point in the upper right hand corner of our screen? 1994, numerous rate increases by the Fed, one increase and two cuts in calendar year 1995, quiet in 1996, and one increase in calendar year 1997. In 1999, the Fed raised rates in June, August, and November, and added three additional rate increases in the first half of the year. Thus, from a state of mind perspective, when we enter the first half of calendar year 2000, investors have seen 14 rate hikes. They've seen the federal funds rate increase from 3% down here all the way to 6.5% in the first half of calendar year 2000. The stock market has done extremely well. We're in a rising interest rate environment and thus from a relative perspective and from an environment perspective, bonds are not particularly appealing when the Fed is raising rates. We do have some rate cuts in here, but the bias unequivocally between point A and point B favors rate hikes. Similar situation between a low in October of 2002, left side of the screen, and the peaking process in calendar year 2007. Again, we're looking at the S&P 500. 2004, five rate hikes. 2005, eight rate increases from the Federal Reserve, 2006, four more. So when we enter calendar year 2007, looking backwards, we have 17 rate hikes in our short-term memory banks. The federal funds rate has increased from 1% all the way up to five and a quarter percent. Once again, the stock market's done extremely well. So you might think in this environment, Fed's raising rates, stocks are doing well, no one would be interested in buying bonds here. At the end of 2006, the last three years, so all of 2006, all of 2005, and all of 2004, every single move by the Federal Reserve has been to increase interest rates, no rate cuts in this three-year period. And then we have no rate cuts between the end of 2006 and mid-September 2007. Thus, even after the stock market has peaked in October of 2007, it'd be very, very easy to think that bonds are risky here. The Fed is doing nothing but raising interest rates, and that puts downward pressure on bond prices. Now let's shift gears and try to understand how all of this can help us in 2018. Now we're looking at the S&P 500. You can make an argument that November of the year 2000 looks similar to December of 2007, which is similar to the present day, or in this case, November 15th, 2018. In all three cases, the S&P falls sharply through a somewhat flat 200 day, falls sharply through a somewhat flat 200 day, same situation here on the right side of your screen. 
we make a low rally back near the 200 day and then have somewhat of a retest of the low look here rally back above the 200 day have somewhat of a retest look here rally back above have somewhat of a retest look in mid-november 2018 and we already know in the present day given what the fed's been doing in the history of interest rates that many people believe that bonds are risky we also just established that you can make an argument that psychology was very very similar at this point here in 2007 and this point here in the year 2000. looking backwards from the market peak in march of 2000 it's hard to make an argument that's an attractive environment to be buying bonds and looking backwards for the end of 2006 or even mid-September 2007, it's hard to make an argument based on what's been happening with the Fed and interest rates that bonds are an attractive proposition, especially from a psychological perspective, taking into account recency bias. So you can also make a legitimate and fact-based argument that not only are the charts of the S&P 500 similar in these three periods investor psychology about fixed income instruments also has a lot of similar qualities november 2000 why would i be interested in bonds stocks have been killing it december 2007 why would i be interested in bonds fed's been raising rates and stocks have been killing it we already know that many believe that bonds are a dead asset in the present day. So given that the stock market is starting to look unquestionably riskier here, the 200-day moving average is flat, turning down, 200-day moving average indecisive, indecisive and turning down. And given everything that we just said about interest rates, the million dollar question is, were investors interested in bonds in any shape, form or fashion here or here because we know in the present day it's very very easy and logical to make the argument we're in a rising interest rate environment bonds can't be considered a defensive asset here they're risky because bonds are interest rate sensitive we could have made the same argument here could have made the same argument here so let's compare the exact same points, November 14th, 2000, December 18th, 2007, and November 15th, 2018, some stock bond charts. These are monthly charts. Since a lot of ETFs weren't around back here or didn't have track records, we're using a mutual fund in both cases, VFI and X, basically the same tick for tick as SPY. WHO SX, very, very similar and extremely high correlation to TLT, or long-term treasury bonds in the ETF world. Let's compare the charts. And remember, we're comparing at a very, very similar and indecisive and concerning period in terms of the way the S&P 500 looks. So in mid-November 2000, the stock bond ratio is making a multi-month new low. Same thing here in 2007, a multi-month new low. Contrast that with November 15, 2018. We just recently made a new 15-year high in this ratio. This looks nothing like a 15-year high, and this looks nothing like a 15-year high. In this case, the stock bond ratio peaked 11 months ago, telling us that investors were indeed interested in bonds in late 1999, well before the S&P 500 peaks and well before things got really ugly in the S&P 500, which occurs after September 1st of 2000. Similar situation here. S&P 500 peaks here. People are interested in bonds before the S&P 500 peaks. The ratio peaked seven months ago, looking back here, 11 months ago here, making a discernible 
lower high, lower high, lower lows, lower high, lower low. Compare that to the present day. We just recently made a new 15-year high, telling us unequivocally that the conviction to own defensive-oriented assets was higher here and it was higher here relative to the present day, and it's not even close. How about momentum? Momentum is rolling over with monthly MACD clearly against stocks in favor of bonds. This happens basically as the S&P 500 peaks, and it happens well before when things get ugly in September of 2000. Similar situation here. We get the bearish cross on the monthly chart telling us that momentum was favoring stocks here, and now it's starting to favor bonds from a conviction perspective. We don't have anything like that on November 15th, 2018. This is almost somewhat of a momentum test. We pass. We still have white space between black and red. How about if we look at the daily charts at the exact same time? So we're still looking at this point here, this point here, and this point here, where in all three cases, the S&P 500 and the technicals were looking shaky. Right off the bat, we can see that the stock bond ratio in this case and this case looks radically different from the present day or November of 2018. In this case, we have multiple months of consolidation here. This is like pushing the Coke machine, getting it rocking back and forth. We have somewhat of a false breakdown, and then eventually we get a true breakdown here. The longer a market goes sideways, the bigger the move we can expect to get. The longer a market goes sideways, the bigger the move we can expect to get. We don't have anything like that in the present day. If anything, this almost looks like somewhat of a mirror image of these two cases. In all three cases, consolidation, consolidation, consolidation. In this case, we get a bullish breakout, what looks like a retest, and now we're back above the green box. The conviction to own bonds is much higher here, much higher here, than it is here. And yet, the S&P 500 charts all look concerning. And you could make an argument in the present day that no one's interested in bonds because we're in a rising interest rate environment. Well, we've just unequivocally proven the same argument applies here. 17 rate hikes in the rearview mirror, 14 rate hikes in the rearview mirror. Fed funds moves from 3 to 6.5 in the rearview mirror. Here, fresh in our minds, is a move from one to five and a quarter. Since our approach uses the weight of the evidence, let's look at some moving average crossovers. Daily charts, the exact same charts, the exact same periods we've been looking at. This is the generic and for illustrative purposes only 50 day in blue and the 125 day simple moving average in red. Remember, we're comparing apples to apples to apples. We're trying to understand what asset class behavior was telling us here, what it was telling us here, and what it's telling us in mid-November of 2018. In this case, we get a bearish cross. Blue drops below red. Red rolls over eight months in the rearview mirror. This is conviction shifting eight months ago. Here, conviction clearly starts to shift from a trend perspective, looking back three months, and in our apples to apples to apples comparison with the S&P 500, this really doesn't look anything like this, and this really doesn't look anything like this. Let's make it as thorough as we possibly can because this is extremely important. Let's compare all three periods again this time using our generic and for illustrative purposes only 100 day in blue all the way out to the 290 day in gold. Mid-November 2000, mid-December 2007, present day 2018, mid-November.
This pretty much sums it up. Blue, our fastest moving average is on the bottom. And for the most part, we have a full bore bearish look against stocks, favoring the conviction to own defensive oriented long-term treasuries relative to growth oriented stocks. Same basic conclusion here, maybe not a full bore bearish, but we're well on our way. Blue, the fastest moving average, has moved from the top to the bottom. We can't even see it on the top here because conviction shifted so long ago. In the present day, here's the exact same ratio using the exact same moving averages. This looks quite a bit better than this and this. And as we know, is it possible that this is going to morph into something like this or this? Absolutely, positively, yes. And this applies to every chart we've looked at so far. It could happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Instead of having blue on the bottom, blue is on the top. And for the most part, all of our slopes are up. And just like this is, for the most part, a full bore bearish look, this is, for the most part, a full bore bullish look, telling us that from an investment preference and opportunity cost perspective, the odds of bad things happening are higher here. The odds of bad things happening are higher here. And on a relative basis, they are lower in the present day, which is another way of saying the probability of getting a bullish resolution in the present day from an ugly looking set of technicals is higher here than it was here or here. Thus, now that we've shown that you could have made this argument, we're in a rising interest rate environment, thus bonds can't be considered defensive because bonds are interest rate sensitive. It would have been logical to make that argument in the present day. It would have been logical to make that argument in December of 2007, and it would have been logical to make that argument in November of 2000, which begs the question. When we're looking at very similar and concerning profiles on the S&P 500, why does this chart look so much better than this chart and this chart? Why did this ratio peak 11 months ago telling us that 11 months in the rear view mirror, the conviction to own bonds started to pick up significantly relative to the conviction to own stocks. The same thing could be said here, looking seven months backwards from this point. Why is momentum shifting in favor of bonds away from stocks? Why is momentum shifting and why is momentum holding? In the simplest terms, confidence and fear. Fear of bad things happening. Fear of bad things happening. And it's very difficult to make the argument that the fear of bad things happening is as high today as it was here or here. If that were the case, we would expect this chart to look more like this chart and this chart. Why is the conviction picking up way back here and picking up way back here despite the environment? Because in this period here and in this period here, unlike this period here thus far, some investors are very confident the economy is heading for a recession. Thus, they're confident the Fed will cut rates. Rate cuts help bonds. They also see bad things happening and they want to get out of the stock market. And like most of the things that we all do in the stock market, there's a profit motive. They think they can make money in bonds. Why would I think that I can make money in bonds given everything I know here? And why would I think I can make money in bonds given everything I know here? Including in both cases, the stock market hasn't even peaked yet because I'm anticipating these rate cuts based on these bullet points. And the most important thing is this, did it help mitigate losses? Did it increase the probability of making money? The answer is absolutely positively yes. This is the relative performance 
Long-term treasury bonds, so think TLT is in blue. Vanguard Index 500 fund, think SPY in red. This is as of June 12th, 2007. This is several months before the S&P 500 peaks. And bonds, boring bonds in a rising interest rate environment are already outperforming growth-oriented stocks. Did anticipating these rate cuts help mitigate losses and increase the odds of making money? Yes. From June of 2007 to March 6th of 2009, the TLT, like mutual fund, gained over 44%. During the same period, the SPY, like mutual fund, dropped over 52%. Those seem like good reasons to buy bonds in a rising interest rate environment. How about in January of the year 2000? 14 rate hikes in the rearview mirror, an increase from 3 to 6.5. Why would I want to buy bonds in here before the stock markets even peaked? For the exact same reasons, some investors did it early in 2007, before the stock market peaked. This is what they believe. This is what they're anticipating. They're hoping to mitigate losses and potentially earn some profits. Did it work? On January 14th, 2000, with 14 rate hikes in the rearview mirror, if you bought bonds here over three months before the S&P 500 peaked, you beat the stock market. Between January 14th of 2000 and October 9th of 2002, the TLT, like mutual fund, gained over 43%, and the SPY, like mutual fund, lost over 45%. Those who were pessimistic about the economy and confident that the Fed would most likely cut rates and bought in here, bought bonds, sold stocks, were rewarded when the Fed cut rates 11 times in calendar year 2001, 11 cuts in a row, and an additional cut came on November 6th of 2002, helping drive up bond prices, mitigate losses, profit motive, despite a rising interest rate environment and an environment that appears to be very unfriendly to own bonds. The fact that many people still view bonds as a risky asset in the present day speaks to the strength of the economy. These are bearish divergences. The high is made before the stock market peaks in here the high is made before the stock market peaks. This is a bullish divergence. This ratio made its highest closing high after the stock market did in September. So let's review some hard economic data, recent data points that were published this week in 2018 and compare them to the same data here to see, was it logical to be concerned? Was it logical to be concerned? And is it logical for many market participants not to be as concerned about a recession as they were here and here? This is industrial production. If you know your market history, you know the S&P 500, the bear market, really didn't get ugly until after September 1st of 2000, which is several months after the market peaks in March of 2000. Similar situation here. The real ugly financial crisis doesn't start until after a sharp counter trend rally finishes in mid-May of 2008. It gets very ugly after this date, and it gets very ugly in the stock market after this date. So before things got ugly, we could see that industrial production was basically 
flatlining or consolidating. This is a weakening trend. We can draw a line and hit the same data point three months back. Here, we can draw a line and hit the same data point four months back. This looks like a trend that might be rolling over. Similar situation here, except the rollover points much, much longer. I can see all of this before it really gets ugly after May 19th, 2008. 11 months of sideways movement point to point, roughly 16 months of sideways movement point to point. Yellow flag in the economic data, yellow flag in the economic data. How does the exact same chart look today when we have a concerning stock market? The answer is much, much better. Industrial production, new high, based on the number that was announced on Friday. If I draw a line going backwards here, I don't hit any data points going all the way back into calendar year 2016. This really doesn't look anything like this concerning rollover look here, nor does this look anything like this concerning rollover look. So this data is telling us it's logical that people were migrating to bonds in this area and logical that people were migrating to bonds in this area. And I think you can make a case based on this one data point. It's logical that they're not migrating to bonds in mass in the present day. After we could see this consolidation, the S&P dropped an additional 53%, backing up the claim that it really didn't get ugly until after September 1st. After we could see over a year of rollover look, the S&P lost an additional 49.8%, again, backing up the claim that while the stock market peaked in October of 2007, it didn't get really, really ugly until the other side of this chart. We can also make some interesting observations if we take a big step back on industrial production. Okay, this is industrial production here, 1919, left side of the screen. Okay, consolidation period here and a bullish breakout, a new high in the early 1950s. The longer industrial production consolidates, the bigger the move or the bigger the boom we can expect to get. We get a big boom in industrial production after this breakout in the early 1950s. Good things happen for a long period of time. This is an economy that needs to consolidate its gains. And that's exactly what happened. If you look at these charts, this point here is the exact same data point as this point here for the most part, sideways. This point here is basically the exact same data point here. That's how we draw the box. This point here is basically the same level here. That's a sideways movement. This point here is basically the same as this point here. And then like this period here, we get a bullish breakout the longer we go sideways, the bigger the move we can expect to get. The longer the consolidation in industrial production, the bigger the boom that may follow. Once again, industrial production needs to consolidate its gains. Draw the boxes the same way. This level here is the same as this level here. That's a horizontal line. This level here is the same as this level here, which is the same as this level here. So we have very, very similar situations. Early 1950s, early 1980s, and this is just breaking out above these levels. It happened in April of this year. Clients and regular viewers may remember that the 1950s and the 1980s are sparking some movement in your short-term memory. Why is that? Because long before we looked at this chart of industrial production, we covered these charts that told us there were some wonderful setups in the early 1950s. The Dow gained an additional 322% over 15 years. Market needs to consolidate its gains. Another and very, very similar setup in the early to mid 1980s, after we could see all of this, measure it and put it in a model, the Dow tacked on an additional 
658% and rallied for an additional 14 years from point A to point B. And as we've covered in the past, the present day, this chart is August of 2018. This looks similar to this. This looks similar to this. And we can say the same thing for Bollinger Bandwidth, RSI, and numerous indicators, including moving average crossovers. These dates here and this date here line up well with this consolidation and this breakout, a boom, consolidation, a boom, the biggest consolidation of all three, telling us to keep an open mind from a very long-term perspective that good things could happen for a long period of time. To keep an open mind that good things could happen for a long period of time. These charts speak to the very long term and they do not discount the concerning data that we have in hand in the present day. In the present day, we are not out of the woods yet. Is there any other logical reasons from a fundamental perspective why investors began to embrace bonds between the end of 2006 in mid-September 2007, despite having a lot of rear view information, factual information that said bonds are risky here. Let's take a quick look at credit spreads. If you're not familiar with credit spreads and why they're helpful, a simple example is probably best. If a government bond is paying 3%, and a corporate bond from a startup is paying 8%, there's a reason why there is a spread between the two. And that reason is one word, risk. The probability of default on the government bond, for the most part, is basically zero because it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, in theory. And if the startup company that's offering an 8% yield on their bonds goes belly up, then you're not going to get your 8% and you might not even get your principal back. So when the economy begins to weaken or people believe that it's weakening and or interest rates are rising, credit spreads tend to widen because the perceived risk of holding that 8% bond is higher than the perceived risk of holding the safe government bond. The higher the risk, the bigger the spread between the two. If there wasn't any risk for the 8% bond, nobody would invest in the 3% bond. There's no free lunch in the financial markets. All right, credit spreads. Thursday, October 16th, 1997, 2.47%. By the time the market was about to get ugly in September, all the way up to 6.48. Similar situation here. May 29th, 2007. Spreads at 2.42. They balloon in March 2008, all the way up to 8.37. After we could see this move, it got really ugly roughly two months later. Now, it should be noted from looking at this, you can see credit spreads can widen quickly, but here they widen quickly long before it gets ugly in the stock market. Not so much in this case. They do start to widen fairly quickly, and we have to understand that that can happen. Has it happened yet? So before we compare these charts to the present day, Credit spreads before it got really ugly in the stock market in September of 2000 were basically rising. The trend was up for three years. You have this kind of safe, flat, confident look, and then it changes. We go from a low here to a high here over three years. Here, not nearly as much lead time. You only have a higher bias for about 11 months which does underscore that spreads can move quickly and they may not give you that much warning. But the point is, nothing bad has happened here. 
We need to see it, measure it, and put it in a model. Yes, it's true that bad things may happen in the present day, but they haven't happened yet. This is Thursday, November 15th. Spreads 4.11. Not extremely tame, but not extremely concerning. But the more important thing is, instead of a higher bias, a clear higher bias, instead of a clear higher bias, if we look in the rear view mirror, we're basically at the identical spread today in November of 2018 that we were in March of 2017, which means instead of having a clear higher bias, instead of having a clear higher bias, we've basically gone nowhere for 602 calendar days. You really could even extend that back here into late 2016. Is it possible that spreads are going to move quickly? Absolutely, positively, yes. But we could have said the same thing here in March of 2017 or even late 2016. Stock market's done extremely well since this point here, and spreads are basically in the same spot today. Spreads over 8% here, ugly. Not as bad here, but ugly at 64 Present day was more moderate at 4.1. Maybe make an argument that there's some smoke here, but you could have made the same argument here in 2017. And right, if you follow Shivako Capital on Twitter, many of you I know are following Urban Carmel as well. So this is nothing new because this is Urban's work. We're just expanding on it a little bit. Here is his Twitter handle. You can Google all of this to find him on Twitter. You don't have to be on Twitter or even like Twitter to follow Urban. You can bookmark his page. This is retail sales adjusted for inflation. We just got a new retail sales number this week. So this is fresh data. Just to make sure we're giving credit where credit is due. This is Urban's chart. You can see his arrows here. We're just using the larger version to illustrate some concepts and expand on his concepts. Remember, we said the stock market gets ugly in May of 2008. So retail sales had already been consolidating and dropping. In fact, they had reached a point where we could draw a line and basically go back three years. So this is a yellow flag here before it gets really, really ugly in the stock market. Well, that really doesn't look anything like the present day. We just made a new all-time high. Doesn't look like a sideways movement. We're not going backwards and hitting something from three years earlier. Three years earlier is way back here. We also said, if you know your market history, the stock market got really ugly after September 1st of 2000. You don't get as much lead time here because you get a strong look here but you do get somewhat of a sideways to down bias about 10 months before things got ugly in the S&P 500. And notice there are plenty of warning signs before the recession in the shaded area, plenty of warning signs before the recession, the shaded area. This the present day 2018 really doesn't look anything like this. And this really doesn't look anything like this 10 month lead time here before things tanked in September of 2000. So once again, we have some hard data that differentiates the risk of a recession between this period, this period, and this period. Hard data that differentiates the risk of a recession from this period, this period, both quite a bit different than this period. Another set of hard data that differentiates September of 2000 concerning May of 2008 concerning pre present day. If I draw a line going backwards, I don't hit anything going all the way back into 2016. Quite a bit different than this and this. All of these data points, including the data in the present day, tell us it is logical that investors were already migrating towards bonds and defensive assets. Investors were already migrating towards bonds and defensive assets. Despite 
what's in the rear view mirror because in those two cases all of these bullet points applied and they were anticipating rate cuts the look of the present day chart on a relative basis tells us from a conviction perspective some people believe all of this and this that's not the net aggregate opinion the net aggregate opinion does not subscribe to these bullet points and the net aggregate opinion of all market participants they are not anticipating rate cuts coming down the pike anytime soon especially successive rate cuts for a long period of time which basically tells us they're not trying to avoid or mitigate longer term stock losses and they don't believe that they should be migrating to bonds because they don't believe the Fed is going to help them out by cutting rates month after month after month or quarter after quarter. And it's pretty difficult to argue with that theory. And of course, this is all just a theory when we look at the facts that we had in hand in November of 2000, December of 2007, and on November 15th, 2018. Obviously, this is subject to change, but it hasn't changed yet. So we've shown in these periods here that bonds are clearly outperforming stocks. Bonds are clearly outperforming stocks. And we've unequivocally shown that during this period, bonds significantly outperform stocks. The financial crisis bear market. And the same thing can be said for the dot-com bust. Bonds killed stocks. These charts and trends were anticipating that outperformance by bonds, anticipating the outperformance by bonds, or at least helping us with the probabilities, not anticipating here from a probability perspective. If you know your market history, you know there are other periods in history where stocks and bonds dropped in unison. You're probably already thinking 1994, it's a Fortune Magazine article, The Great Bond Massacre. 1994, when the Fed was raising rates, sound familiar? Stocks and bonds both performed poorly. We really don't even need to look at returns. If they're referring to the bond market as a massacre in 1994, then we can see from this chart here, this is the S&P 500, the Fed's raising rates and stocks are struggling as well. A couple takeaways here. Number one, remember we said earlier that the Fed only raised rates one time in 1995. Rate hike after 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 rate hike. Stocks and bonds both struggle. Sound familiar? A lot of rate hikes in the rearview mirror. Stocks and bonds both struggling. How could things possibly improve in the present day? Well, one theory is pretty simple. The Fed says they've reached normalization and they stop raising rates as they did here. Stocks could conceivably take off. You may also remember 1994 seems familiar. Stocks and bonds both struggled. 1994 bonds massacred stock struggle. And you might remember this tweet from this week. Let's assume you went max defense on 1-1-2018 and moved to 100% long-term treasury bonds. Meaning, if you were fearful that a recession and bear market were on the way and you were anticipating Fed rate cuts, as we have shown, it's very, very logical when you're fearful of all of those things and confident about rate cuts that you migrate to bonds. Hasn't worked. If you migrated to that max defense stance on January 1st, TLT is down 8.22% year to date as of November 14th. You might also recall stock and bond prices were similar to the present day in 1994. And last week we covered the fractals that were similar. 1994, 1995, similar to this fractal. Stocks and bonds don't do well in 1994. Very, very similar kind of indecisive 
confused look in 2018 as we covered last week. December 1994, similar look to November 1st, 2018. Said we had a lot of similar setups. December 1994, November 2018, CCI ADX Copic Curve. Last week, MACD, RSI, Rate of Change, Williams Percent R, True Strength Index, Tricks are for Kids, and Full Stochastics. And we might also remember, despite all of the concerns in 1994, and despite these concerning looks on the chart, and despite price being below a downward sloping 200-day moving average, once the Fed backed off the series of rate hikes in early 1995, good things happened for a long period of time. Once the Fed backed off the rate hikes, nearing an end in late 1994, markets looking ahead to this period. From this similar look here, similar to the present day, Good things happen for a long period of time, telling us to keep an open mind about better than expected outcomes. And we can't emphasize enough, none of this erases or takes away the 100% legitimate concerns that we have in the short to intermediate term. The market has a lot to prove to us. We have just covered a lot of information that tells us to keep an open mind about better than expected outcomes, especially from a longer term perspective, looking out several weeks, months, and years. None of that negates or discounts the vast quantity of concerning information that we have in hand on shorter and intermediate term timeframes, including a bearish MACD cross that occurred on the monthly chart of the S&P 500 at the end of October. If you look at the numbers here, black is slightly below red, telling us that long-term momentum is very vulnerable and rolling over here. Is this concerning? Absolutely, positively, yes. How concerning. And from our perspective, we wanted to answer this question. Can we find cases where something like this happens and in relatively short order, the market reverses in a bullish manner? The second question is, how long might that take? And number two, how much damage might occur in those cases, the bullish outcomes, between this cross at the end of a month and the lows? So to answer those questions, we're doing some data mining. We are purposely looking at and skewing the data by reviewing the bullish cases because doing that will help us answer those questions. If the longer term data and trends rule the day and we reverse ourselves after seeing evidence of slowing momentum, what's a realistic expectation even under a bullish outcome? So here's what we're looking at. And hats off to Kathy here. She helped tremendously with this part of the video and the math. 1984. We get a bearish cross on the last day of the month. The 31st was a weekend. And this shows us what happened next. Eventually, good things happened. 1987 crash. Cross, eventually, good things happened. End of April 1990. Black drops below red. We can see that, measure it, put it in a model, slowing momentum. Eventually, Good things happen. Similar situation, end of September 1992. If we fast forward, eventually good things happened in the market. Momentum still, though, was concerning. So this shows you that good things can happen in the stock market when MACD is, has a very unsettling and unnerving look as it does here. We get the cross that we don't want, slowing momentum, end of September 1998. Eventually, good things happen in the S&P 500 monthly. A similar 
barely noticeable but real black drops below red end of August 2006. Good things happen until the market peaks in October of 2007. October 31st, 2011. We've studied this case on short takes. So we have that concerning longer term momentum is rolling over look and eventually the market writes itself and good things happen. So before we review this table, it is unequivocally biased. We are looking at the best case scenarios here and tossing the worst case scenarios, such as 2000 and 2007, 2008. Why? Because we have longer term data in hand that we've just covered that tells us this, the case can be made that this is a correction most likely and not something like a dot-com event or a financial crisis event. So this is a noisy table here, but what it tells us is it's possible that the cross occurs on the day of the low as it did in 1998. Cross came at the end of August. That actually was the lowest closing low. It's also possible like 2006, where you get the cross and the low has already happened. You get the cross, the low has already happened before month end, after that really good things happen. So in these bullish cases, the average drop from the end of the month with the bearish MACD cross to the closing low was about 5.7%, the median roughly 4%. If we go from the end of the month when we get the cross, so the equivalent would be the end of October, we have a cross, to the lowest low on average, we fell 7% and the median drop was 5%. And in both cases, it took somewhere between 53, 52-ish to 35-ish calendar days from the end of the month till you hit the low. So net net bottom line, this says if you were patient in these cases for 50 to 35 days, you were rewarded because good things on average happened looking out one month, three months, six months, one year, two years. So one month after you get the MACD cross in a monthly chart, average gain roughly 1%, three months roughly 6%, six months, let's call it 8%, one year, maybe 15%-ish, two years out, maybe about 32, 33%, telling us that if you were patient in these cases and withstood a drawdown, good things eventually did happen. Based on these numbers and the low that we've already had, the S&P 500 could still fall somewhere between four and 90 points below the low that was made on October 29th, not too bad. If we only had to withstand a four to 90 point drop below the October low, and then gains like this followed, we'd be willing to try to be patient. Again, we specifically did this analysis to help us answer some questions that we were interested in. And we feel like the exercise was very helpful. You can find a ton of great information on Urban's Twitter feed here. Here's his handle. And to try to keep this video a little bit shorter, clients, be helpful to review this post on short takes. It talks a lot about trying to balance the need to reduce capital destroying whipsaws and the need to protect capital on the downside. And those same incredibly important topics are expanded in this November 14th post. And this post also contains links to some other key posts about our strategy and the tactics that we'll be using. All of this speaks in general terms and is not specific investment advice for any particular individual. This post also helps answer the question, is there any factual basis to believe the market could 
be trying to form a low in the present day. And it provides some generic and for illustrative purposes only guideposts to help us try to balance our objectives going forward. We've got a ton of information in hand that's telling us to be concerned, including the MACD bearish cross that we just covered in the S&P 500. We've got a ton of longer term data, including present day asset class behavior that tells us to keep an open mind about better than expected outcomes. Every statement we've made in this video is a probabilistic statement based on the facts that we have in hand today. If those facts change and when they change, we will reassess the probabilities. The only way that we can implement properly is to head into next week and every week with a flexible, unbiased, and open mind. And just a reminder for clients, there's an incredible amount of information available on our Twitter feed. You can find it by Googling our last name and Twitter. It may also be worth a visit to the new website to see the FAQs. We've got new and expanded FAQs covering traditional investing, low cost passive investing, and the online slash robo strategies that are currently in vogue. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any security or any related financial instruments, nor should any of the content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice, and Shivako Capital Management, LLC, or CCM, is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates or clients may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.